Hey everybody, this is David here. You've probably already noticed by the timestamp on this episode, but it is much shorter than usual. That's because this week, Alexander, my co-host, had just an overwhelming load of work to do for his actual day job as an attorney. So apologize, and we hope that you'll bear with us. Uh, sometimes real life intervenes, but we brought you a little something anyway that we hope you'll enjoy. Look at these three words written larger than the rest with a special pride never written before or since. Tall words proudly saying, we the people. Welcome to the Lex Rex Institute podcast. I'm David. He's Alexander. He's an attorney, but won't be speaking in that capacity. Nothing in this podcast is legal advice. The opinions you hear will be our opinions as individuals, not necessarily the opinions of the Lex Rex Institute. And am I forgetting anything? Lex Rex is Latin for the law is king. Because the law is our only king in the United States, and all of our officials are subject to it. So that's what we try to enforce. And just as a little bit of a disclaimer, if you like it when this podcast is good, <laughs> then this probably isn't the episode for you. So turn it off right now uh, if you don't like it when it's bad, because this episode is going to be bad. Yeah, well, uh, it's just a little. <laughs> we, <bad. laughs> should, we should probably explain a little bit. You have had an incredibly busy week and haven't had I have. time. It's, I don't like it when, you know, I, I had a trial week before last and I never like I mean it, it's good because it was a trial that we went in with a judge that was a very very unfavorable to our case uh -huh. just going out out the door you know that's or out the gate a uh, very unfavorable never great when you're going into a hostile room but apparently we must have had a good effect because they asked for additional briefing in this case which generally means that they're not decided yet if they want additional briefing so it's good but it means hours and hours of more more work for me since I'm the only attorney at Lex Rex that was prepped on this case yeah. So into an already busy week, that monkey wrench got thrown, and I've not had time to prep anything for the podcast. <laughs> I also, you know, we could sort of do a retread of the event that I was at last night. Last night I was at a uh, town hall discussing corruption and accountability for public officials. Although if you listen to this podcast, you've probably heard most of the accountability stuff before. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> where, where do you want to go, David? Well, uh, you know, I have a few things prepared, but the you know the drawback of me being the one who had time to prepare for this is that I am not an attorney, and you know, I I know a little <laughs> bit, but not very much, all things considered, about the law. So um, you're a little close to your mic, David. Just ba back off a little bit from the mic. Okay. Yeah, it's. I think it's clipping a little. Okay. Bit. Um, but uh, we're gonna kick things off with. I guess the second edition of I think we settled on the name Alligator Alley for our yeah, spelled spelled like allegation, not like the yeah the lizard, uh, which is our segment on etymologies, which you know was an audience request. Yeah, believe it or not, we haven't gotten any complaints on that segment yet, so we're going to keep doing yeah. it. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, if you don't like it, complain and we'll stop. Yeah, uh, but it might be the highlight of this episode. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but you know, given that I am in well not merry old england i was about to say that but i am in the uk and in the uk they really don't talk very much about lawyers they talk about well two things barristers barristers and, and solicitors. solicitors and yeah in canada occasionally because canada is similar to the u.s yeah. you'll often get attorney's offices will say barrister and solicitor yeah. Technically, that's what lawyers are in the United States as well. We are barristers and solicitors. Right. So for today, I thought we'd talk about where the term barrister comes from, because solicitor is, a, you know, it's applied to legal professionals, but it's more general. And in, in Can I guess? Where barrister comes from? Yeah. Yeah, I, I bet you can. I'm almost 100% positive <laughs> you can. I think it probably comes from bar. It does. Because they're the ones who could pass the bar. <laughs> yes, that is exactly correct. And Because a solicitor cannot go past the bar. Right. That's um, And so, yeah. you know, in, in this case, when we say pass the bar, we don't mean pass the bar exam, which is usually what we would mean. Now, that's an examination that shows that you're qualified to go past the actual right. bar. Right. And so <laughs> what is the bar that we're talking about? Well, in courtrooms, a rail or bar separates sort of the business end where you know, the judge and the witnesses would be and the jury and the, the attorneys from where people watching would sit. And being permitted to go past the bar means that you are qualified to actually participate in the trial as, well, a barrister in this case. And England has separate licensing for being able to represent clients, which is what a solicitor does. Yeah. So solicitor typically is more client-facing, barrister is more court-facing. Yeah. 
because they can go past the I, I did a little bit of research on this because while that is the very broad strokes of it, then that holds true that, yeah, you know, a solicitor is primarily going to be dealing with the clients, talking to them about what their wants and goals are, including in, you know, non-trial situations. You can draft contracts. Yeah. They can... And anything that doesn't require going before a judge on somebody else's. Behalf. Right. So, but I did a little poking into this, though, and it turns out that the, you know, the admission past the bar begins in the high courts in England. So, you know, below right. certain values or, you know, for certain kinds of cases, a solicitor is, you know, permitted to represent a, a, a client in the court as well. And I found this out as well. In 1990, they passed a bit of reform bill that created a new class of solicitor advocates. So these are people who are, you know, primarily solicitors, but they do have, you know, certain circumstances where they would perform the functions which were normally for barristers. Anyway, all that to say, it's much more complicated. That's, I assume that's because barristers are too expensive, right? <laughs> uh, I think that's part of it. I think another part of it was that people didn't find barristers particularly easy to work with because they're not used to dealing with clients. <laughs> they're not really people. That actually sounds kind of great. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the, the old legal joke goes, and I'm sorry if you're a client that's listening to this. Most of my clients are great. A um, few of them are hard, but most of my clients are great. But there's an old legal joke that practicing law, great profession, except for the clients. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most, most lawyers prefer dealing with, you know, esoteric matters of law over dealing with people. It's just kind of the way that we're wired. Yeah. That's and, you know, <laughs> I, I can speak from experience in some other fields and say it's not only the legal profession that has that kind of inclination, but, you know, the world would be great if it weren't for all the Really, people. most other fields prefer dealing with esoteric legal facts. <laughs> not quite that necessarily, but, you know, it's sort of <laughs> dealing with their own specialty, their own domain, rather than oh, dealing sure. with the actual people. <laughs> but Yeah, of course. Anyway, we didn't have this on our list of reasons to be glad for American independence, but, you know, you could. It's a little simpler to, to engage yeah. a lawyer in the American system. It's, it's sort of a, you know, it's an ongoing thing in America, too. You can read about this in Justice Neil Gorsuch's book, which is available on our website for a donation, a suggested donation price. Uh, and he talks about how there's, there's sort of an ongoing issue in America where lawyers are so doggone expensive. People keep wanting to explore different ways to allow non-lawyers to practice law so that people can yeah. still get representation they need. Sure. I don't think that's the way to do it, folks. People need competent representation. You want somebody who has been trained in the law to represent you. You really do. Like, this yeah. isn't, it's not something you can just BS. It's, <laughs> I'm not saying like lawyers are the best, smartest people. I don't think they are. A lot of them are idiots. But <laughs> it's it definitely requires a specialized knowledge set yeah. That, and there's a reason you have to have a kind of a lot of education to be able to do that. So I, I think much better option is exactly what we're doing, what Lex Rex Institute is doing, is you have nonprofit groups set up for the advocacy of different kinds of interests. And then people that care about that interest can donate and make sure that those cases can be brought much less expensively than they would by a regular general practice law firm. So, you know, that's... Donate to Lex Rex. Yeah, it really does. It goes directly to the representation of our clients. We don't want to charge market rates for legal representation, but believe me, it's hard to run an office where you don't do that. So yeah. Yeah, every day I hear people saying, how can I get involved in the defense of our Constitution? And then you give them a thousand volunteer opportunities, and they say, I don't have any time. I can't do that. Well, typically you got either one or the other. You have either time or you have money. One great way that you can come on board and join this fight is to contribute. So you can do that, lexrex.org slash donate, or you can just buy Justice Gorsuch's book, and that's a donation too. Is the point of the etymology section always going to be to do plugs for donating? Not necessarily, but I think that was fine. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so so why isn't so why is it barrister, though? Why isn't it just like barrier or bear or barrer? Barrer, even. But I think the answer to both of those is that that sounds kind of weird. Um, mm. But, uh, but that's, that's no know, reason not to. A, a, you have alligator or Hobson Jobson. Yeah, a, a barrier is already a different thing, also. Um, and I think a fair that, point. That, a fair, that so is a bar, did though. Factor in yes, but not a barrister. That is that's true. As far as I'm aware, there's really only one meaning of that word. Well, that's true. And you know, it's sort of. 
I don't know if this is just me, but the sort of class of words that ends in stir, pollster, jokester, that sort of thing, that feels very British to me. That doesn't seem like something that Americans would have made up. That that feels like something that definitely originated in That's England. That's fair. As opposed yeah. to any other English. We just like words. adding ER. Yeah. Like, we're like lawyer. We're a strong and simple people. <laughs> we we add a Y because you can't just have law or Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so it's i think all barristers in england i think they have to be solicitors first and then you have to get additional training i think either as a clerk you might have to study at one of the inns of court uh it used to be that all legal training was by apprenticeship yeah which is probably you know that's that's a good way to do it there's a lot you don't learn in law school about the actual practical ins and outs of representation i think probably some combination would be ideal like they make medical doctors do but i'm glad yeah. i didn't have to do that <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's always the, the tough thing where you're like, oh, it would have been so good if I'd, you know, gotten this kind of experience or this kind of training. And then someone said, well, well, you could volunteer and just do it now. It's just you never actually want to do it when it <laughs> push comes to show. Well, effectively, for your first year, maybe year and a half of practice, you're basically an apprentice. Yeah. Like you, you don't know what you're doing, practically speaking. That's So effectively, most lawyers have done that. Yeah. No, I have... Um, I've worked for a couple of different law firms in various capacities, never as an attorney, because again, I am not an attorney, but I, I will say, yeah, that, that is definitely something I observed when there were new attorneys in the firm, they were almost always just sort of present in the room and their time wasn't being billed to the client. They were basically just observing. Right. And yeah, you know, I think that there's obvious value to that. Oh yeah. That's a huge benefit. So we mentioned we'd talk about something else. I've already forgotten what it was. David, did you write that down? Oh, I remember what it was. Yale. No, I forgot again. The, uh, the, ju Yale, the judges that's right. and the Yale clerks. <laughs> yeah. 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 So 12 fairly prominent federal judges. So far, 12. There may have been others that signed on now. Actually, as of the time of the article, which was about a month ago now. Uh, 12 high-profile federal judges decided they were no longer going to hire clerks from Yale. Yeah. And their reason stated was that Yale had recently canceled a number of high-profile legal speakers. I think one of them was Justice Clarence Thomas that they hmm. had canceled. I could be wrong. But people that, for whatever reason, the school didn't like, but who were credible, respectable people within the legal profession. You know, personally, I think there's other schools that are worse offenders than Yale. But it's, well, it's a step in the right direction, at least. Yale, and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, we've alluded to this before. Yale and Harvard in particular also have such an outsized influence in sort of the upper echelons of the legal yeah, world. Yeah, but I think Harvard's a worse offender of this stuff. That, that may be so, but uh, <laughs> I think Yale is ranked number one currently, right, for their, their law school? I mean, Harvard's almost always number one. Well, at any rate. They hire a bunch of celebrities there, and I think they bribe <laughs> people to rank schools and all the rest of it. We um, might not want to include that allegation in the episode. I said, I think. Okay. That's not defamation. Come at me, Harvard. Use your... Anyway. $50 billion endowment to please don't use that to litigate against no. me. <laughs> so we're going to need a lot more donations from you guys if they do that. Yeah. But we would win. <laughs> um, but at any rate, you know, I, I think there's a, to a certain extent, there's, you know, a symbolic dimension. I'm not asserting any factual basis for this contention that I believe they bribe <laughs> college <laughs> ranking people. It just seems like they must. Okay. And if you want to look at their law, I mean, we've read stuff from their law review before. Actually, that would be a good topic. Like, just talk Harvard Law Review. Let's see what's on the front page right now. Okay, so very first page, right here, top article. The Dangerous Few Taking Seriously Prison Abolition and Its Skeptics. Essay by Thomas Ward Frampton. And just to look at the little excerpt at the top saying what it's about. The basic question of how abolitionists would address the dangerous few often receives superficial treatment. The problem constitutes a spectral force haunting abolitionist thought. And then he says, this essay offers two main contributions. One, it maps the diverse ways in which prison abolitionists most frequently respond to the challenge of the dangerous few. So, you know, criminals, whatever. Highlighting the strengths and infirmities of each. And then two, it proposes alternative, hopefully more productive responses that interrogate and probe the implicit premises, empirical, ideological, and moral, embedded in animating questions concerning the dangerous few. Yeah, and, you know... So this is just a what should we do with criminals essay. This is not a law review topic. Yeah, my, my limited experience with the Harvard Law Review has been that it is almost always... Opinions. It's just well, opinion pieces. And like third-rate sociology 
uh-huh. addressed to something in the law. You know, it's stuff that a, an actual so an actual law review topic would be what do we do with prisoners? What have we done in the past with prisoners? Yeah. How did we get to where we are today with the system of what we currently do with prisoners? Are there things that we can learn from the way that we've done it in the past? You know, in, in a more liberal, I understand that's a very conservative approach. In a more liberal context, it might be, what do other countries do with their prisoners? Is that something that we can make work yeah. with the Anglo-American legal system? Or is it incompatible with the American legal system? Right. You know, questions like that. Not just, what should we do with criminals? Let's speculate about it. Yeah. But the first Harvard Law article that I read in depth basically said, yeah, the, this thing that I'm in favor of is against the law, but it shouldn't be. So we should do it anyway. Uh-huh. What was that thing? I don't remember now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was something, you know, it was, I think it had to do with, oh, shoot. I'm not going to remember. It was a very obvious sort of progressive social cause of some sort. I don't remember which one. Might have been something to do with unions, wasn't it? Drug reform or trade unions or something. But, you know, it was something, if you were being honest about it, you would write it as a political article. You would say, this thing shouldn't be illegal. We should reform the law about this thing. But instead, because it was in a law review, it said, yes, this thing is against the law. But it shouldn't be. And Harvard's become (laughs) sort of the training camp for high profile politicians. Yeah. Every every other law school in the country, the joke is that failed lawyers become politicians yep. because they couldn't pass the bar exam, um, which means they can't go past the bar. So, <laughs> yep. Um, Full circle. They but can't at Harvard, it seems like they go to become politicians. They they go intending and planning to be failed lawyers, which is why, <laughs> you know, it's not a very good law school. So that's... <laughs> so Anyway, but enough about Harvard. We were talking about Yale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Yale is not, Yale's a little bit better, but it's not that much better. Anyway, they, they decided they're not going to hire any clerks from Yale. I think that's a good idea because <laughs> it's, no, no, really. I think that college campuses are supposed to be, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a Petri dish of free speech? That's a horrible metaphor. <laughs> but it's supposed yeah, to be the, the, the idea. Breeding ground, that's. <laughs> you know, even the. actually, oddly enough, I was talking about this earlier this week because um, in one of my courses here we were discussing Immanuel Kant and you know when he was writing who you know he was a German philosopher you know before the days of Germany he lived in what was the kingdom of Prussia which went back and forth on issues of sort of official censorship but when he was working they had you know official royal censors and he had a very difficult time getting certain books published because he had some fairly scandalous things to say about politics and religion for that time but Eventually, yeah, I he mostly talked about phenomena, noumena, <laughs> and often, you know, yes. what is a thing in itself. Often, yes, but occasionally he did write more uh, sort of topical things. But one of the ways and they weren't just censored because they were boring. They could have been, and probably should have been. <laughs> but eventually, he was. I able- we, don't, we don't think things should be censored for being boring. That was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah, one of the things he had more difficulty getting past the censors was about religion. I believe it's called uh, religion within the limits of reason alone or something like that. But eventually he convinced them to let him publish it because he was only going to print it at the university press. And he said that he was really only intended for other scholars. And that was a good enough reason to permit, uh, to persuade an authoritarian regime to allow him to publish something. So it used to be, yeah, that universities were sometimes the only safe haven for free speech. Yeah. So it's like almost Much the opposite less the, now. The case. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's good. I think that's a good way to respond to that. All right, boys and girls, young and old, everybody who cares about American law or law throughout the world and throughout the ages, join us once more for Captain Kangaroo Court. Anyways, we're we're gonna have um, more other ridiculous things that happen in law. So let's yeah. take a look at those. All right. First off, a <laughs> suspended judge. This is David just put up an article for me to uh-huh. read. Suspended judge is accused of trying to stop report that he walked around courthouse in underwear. So speaking of censorship, <laughs> um, here is a judge apparently very concerned that it's being bandied about that he was walking around the courthouse without his pants on trying but underneath the robe or because <laughs> um, you wouldn't well, necessarily have to wear pants under those robes, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I think the implication is that he was less close. He was disrobed. Yes, uh, oh. quite literally. Yes. <laughs> um, anyway, it says. A I mean, judge. I can see why, if that's a rumor, then it's not true. I can see why he would want people to stop spreading that. Fair enough. But I don't want to be. I don't want to be the underwear judge. <laughs> <laughs> a Kentucky judge who was temporarily suspended after he was accused of misconduct in connection with an ankle monitoring program is facing new ethics charges. The Kentucky uh, Judicial Conduct Commission now alleges that this judge will leave his name out of it intimidated witnesses in the ethics case against him and used his influence to try to stop a report that he roamed the courthouse in his underwear. According to the new allegations, he learned in April that the public radio station at Murray State University had made a public records request for security footage at the courthouse. Oh, so he, he did st- do it. <laughs> Apparently, yes. He called the station manager, said he had spoken with the university president, and said the university president was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. That makes sense. According to the ethics complaint, the judge asked the station manager to confirm that the news station was not going to run a story about the camera footage of you walking around the courthouse in your underwear. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) You know, there were lots of topics we could have done, David. We could have talked about Alex Kaczynski. Oh, we'll save that for another date. Yeah, write it uh, down. Write it down. That's a good one. Yeah, you know, uh, we have actually discussed bringing him up on the show before, and we've both concluded... There are some things that he's done that we're not even sure we can really talk about in a very sort of censored form. Because some of them are just so... We'll label uh, the episode explicit. <laughs> yeah. Some of the stuff, even just to summarize what he was doing, is um, pretty graphic. <laughs> uh-huh. You, yeah. And this right. is... Keep in mind, this is a guy that was like one pick behind John Roberts when yeah. George W. Bush was picking Supreme Court appointees. Uh, he uh-huh. was a California court, a ju- his Ninth Circuit judge. So presided over lots of the, the cases in California. We were all familiar with him when this stuff came out. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, we all knew he was a weirdo. Uh, yeah. But we, <laughs> we will talk about that someday. Um, but just think, we could have gotten somebody much better than Roberts. Just some weird pervert <laughs> instead of Roberts. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> I'm only kind yeah. of joking. He's <laughs> he probably wouldn't have upheld Obamacare, but <laughs> he was bad in other ways. So. Well, uh, Robert's care, you mean. Robert's um, care. Thank you, David. Yeah. All right. And, okay, let me let me bring up uh, the other one for today. Ex-lawyer gets prison time after staging sham depositions, creating bogus documents to claim court wins. Boy, yep. that's... I've seen people put false stuff on their website before. Um, mm-hmm. I've not seen this. Yeah, well, and, you know... A former California lawyer, it says, some more home state pride for you. Yeah, I guess. Um, (laughs) Has been sentenced to 37 months in federal prison for collecting legal fees from clients and then using phony legal documents to persuade them that he was winning their cases. But they didn't get the money. (laughs) No. Um, There's no way you can give... How how is that? How would that work? You know, I I assume just to kind of string them along for, for longer and then, you know, not clear what the exit strategy is here. You know, it's a fifty-two stayed. million dollar. Oh wait, no. He said he informed a client of a fifty-two million dollar default judgment, and emailed the client <laughs> a phony court order to back up the claim. I see. So he's like, oh, nobody responded to this lawsuit. Now go and collect against him. He knows we're never going to collect the dime of that fifty-two million anyway. So what difference does it make? Kind of thing. Yeah. Seem seems to be yes. But, okay. You know, there. You know, another instance uh, where he apparently claimed he'd obtained a four point two five million dollar judgment and provided a fake court order with the forged signature of a district judge. Ooh. You know. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, this guy ought to get disbarred. This is this is real. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The things you have to worry about when hiring a lawyer, I guess. Yeah. And, That's why uh, you, you got to go based on referrals. It's <laughs> market marketing is easy to do, and this yes. And when they say whatever judgment you. Apparently don't even know if that's true. You don't even know if it was a real case, apparently. so Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, I'm, I am curious how he thought he was going to sort of get out of this little quagmire he'd created for himself because hard to see a way that you don't just have to, I don't know, fake your death and flee to South America or something. But Yeah, um, there's probably a lot of criminal liability there, too. Yeah, you'd think. And he's serving at least a few years, it would seem. All right, well, I've got one. All righty. So it says, this is from Twitter. Okay. I'm waiting for a reaction there. I can't see whatever it is that you've uh, put up. No, I mean just the fact that I brought one from Twitter. 
Uh, that, that's a fair point. You know, you've been really, you've been apt to criticize me for using any website more than once, but uh, Twitter, especially, I feel like. <laughs> oh, it says my niece couldn't sleep because she wanted to know this. If she sold her hair and the buyer committed a murder and left the hair at the crime scene, would her DNA be enough to convict her? She is 12. <laughs> now I can't sleep. So, I mean, firstly, just kind of a scientific observation. I think the DNA is from the root of the hair. I don't, the hair itself is not cells. That's just keratin. Right. It's so, just a, a protein string, basically, yeah. Yeah, so th- no, that don't need to worry <laughs> about that. Secondly, could they convict you on the basis of DNA alone with no other circumstantial evidence to corroborate? Almost certainly not. Yeah. No prosecutor is going to bring that case. Well, Merrick Garland might. <laughs> but <laughs> no. Ouch. In- unless you're a January 6th defendant, no one's going to bring that case. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was going to say something you know, snarky about CSI, but to be fair, I think even CSI wouldn't write an episode where this happened. <laughs> where it's the <laughs> only evidence, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, in all seriousness, DNA evidence in recent years because of shows like CSI, I think we talked about this previously on this podcast. We have, but it bears repeating. But it's been given way, way too much weight by courts in recent years. You know, yeah. DNA is far from infallible evidence. You know, there's certain scientific flaws with it inherently. I'm not going to get into those. But just legally speaking, there's always going to be chain of custody issues. Um, yeah. It doesn't speak anywhere near as loudly as people tend to assume. The best kind of evidence is still going to be witnesses. Yep. Yeah. And even with yeah. DNA, you still need a witness. The witness is usually the person that has custody of the DNA. Right. They're not going to know a whole lot about it. You need... Everything needs to have testimony with it. You Someone's got to vouch for evidence or you can't use it. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's pretty uh, pretty close to universal, if not universally true. No, it's universally. Well, I mean, you can take judicial notice of things, but you couldn't take yeah. judicial notice that so-and-so was at the scene of the crime. That's Judicial notice is for, like, that today is Tuesday or, <laughs> that, right. yeah, you yeah. know, that uh, Texas is a state within the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need someone to... You know, I know there's the, an ancient texts rule for evidence. Do you need someone to testify that something is the ancient text you're saying it is? You can usually take judicial notice of that. Like, the the, the Bible says X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know, you couldn't use the Bible as evidence for the truth that it asserts, but you could right. introduce it as evidence, just as evidence, generally speaking, by taking judicial notice of it. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, but for all practical purposes, certainly, and pretty much... 100% true in general. You need to have testimony accompanying any piece of evidence, physical evidence especially. And yeah, we did talk about this before, but it is a huge problem that Hollywood has persuaded so many people that DNA is better than even eyewitness testimony. Yeah, and it cuts both ways. You know, there's courts where they can't get convictions because they don't have DNA evidence, which is harder to obtain than you would think. You know, there aren't that many yeah. labs that process this. But also, it it, lend, it, it tends to uh, lend itself to convictions as well. So both ways, yeah. it's bad influence both ways. Trust traditional evidence. That works better. Yep. That was more, you know, one of our classic hot takes type of uh, <laughs> type of things. Uh, yeah. That's sort of a throwback. Well, that concludes <laughs> it for today. So thanks again, folks, for listening to Captain Kangaroo Court. We hope that you enjoyed the weird, wacky, wonderful world of law. That's pretty much all I've got to say about that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else to conclude us, David? I don't think so. Um, you know, like we said, this may not be our best episode. Because we warned we, you. We did you know, warn you. We, we did warn you. You know, in the future, you can expect us to do better than this. Uh, we apologize for the sort <laughs> of uh, improvisational quality of this. But sometimes the real world does impinge, especially in a career as a lawyer. You know, thank you for for bearing with us, but uh, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you'll listen again. Yeah, thank you very much, folks. Goodbye.